everybody. Sorry about the swath of sunlight there cutting me across the face. So it's the end of week two of Garb August, and this week was Vintage Smut Week. Now I started the week off by uh, talking about Laid in the Future. Now before I go any further, because this is Vintage Smut Week, I'm going to say this is going to not be safe for work. And I also want a big disclaimer that I am not affiliated with any companies. Any opinions I offer here are my own. Um, and yeah, <laughs> if you have sensitive ears going forward, I mean, I'm not, I'm not monetized by YouTube. I'm not, you know, beholden to any kind of, um, sponsorship or anything. Um, so I'm going to be talking about subject matter. That's probably not going to be too, uh, work safe. Um, so just again, fair warning. All right. Now that's out of the way. Oh, and trigger warning too, because some of the content that I read in these books was a little bit, uh, was actually no, a little bit, it was more than a lot disturbing. So I'm going to be talking about some disturbing content, uh, including Grip. and, uh, essay, including a really uncomfortable gang Grip. scene in tongue and cheek, which I did not read the first time I read it. All right. So let's talk about uh, the first book I want to talk about is Lucky by Jackie Collins, which does tick off one of the Garbagas bingo squares. Uh, now, Lucky is the sequel to Chances, which I read last year, and the second in the book uh, in the San Angelo series of books by Jackie Collins, which is a really fun read, and especially the first two books. Um, later books um, started to get a little formulaic. You know, you have a bunch of people who go through their lives, they go shopping, they have sex, they have, you know, they run their businesses. Um, and then there's usually a subplot that has something to do with violence. Everybody comes together at the end and either somebody gets shot or somebody or something blows up. That's like the big climax of almost every Jackie Collins book. Um, usually somebody has a heart attack too. <laughs> And then they declare their undying love for each other and the book ends with a wedding or a, you know, a baby being born or something. Yeah, it's it's pretty formulaic. Um, but the first couple books, she hadn't kind of fallen back on the tried and true formula. And she, I think some of the problem was that uh, the, before she passed in 2015, she actually pumped out five books in six years. And that's that's quite a lot about you know turn just turnover on the stories so um it's probably why they got kind of formulaic after a while um anyway lucky follows many of the same characters as the first book uh gino san angelo and his daughter lucky who is now in her late 20s early 30s because the the book the course of the book goes from 1970 eight to 1983, 84. So it's a, you know, it's, it spans a few years. Um, and while Gino was away in Israel, serving out some kind of tax exile, uh, Lucky took over running his businesses. And then he's been back for a year and they've been really close and they've just, you know, completely repaired the relationship that they had when they were, when, Lucky was a teenager. Now, Lucky, to read Lucky, you don't actually have to have read Chances, although it does help. Um, any Anything that calls back to any of the action in Chances, you do get a little blurb to kind of catch you up, which um, is, is like just really good structurally. And uh, so, and we also meet some new characters, uh, Lenny Golden, who's a uh, comedian on the rise as an actor, as a stand-up comic and actor. And uh, Lucky's old school friend, Olympia, who had a smaller role in the first book, but now is one of the main characters. And Olympia's dad, and then all the various wives and mistresses of Gino and Dimitri and <laughs> Lucky's one night stands. And I mean, it's just, uh, it is a great book because the, the pacing of it is fantastic. Uh, it's a 744 pages. It's a long book, but it does not feel that long because it's so quick. 
and there's just so much going on. Um, highly recommend it. Really fun, trashy, exciting read, great characters. And, um, and you know, any streaming service, if you're listening, do a redo. Uh, the miniseries was terrible. Please make a series out of the San Angelos. I guarantee you, that, I mean, there are readers who would absolutely love to see it happen. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be big and lavish and expensive and just one of those fantastic series that, uh, will hopefully make money for the streaming service, but uh, I can dream. In my head canon, there's a series out there. <laughs> All right, um, the next book that I read was probably the book that introduced me to Smut in the first place. Now, I, I mentioned this in the Truth or Dare video that when I was a kid, I think I was probably around 12 because I think my mother had gotten it from her boyfriend and he passed away when I was 12. So maybe, maybe 11. So somewhere in that, that time period, I, yeah, cause my mom wasn't home and that was the year when my mom was never home. So, um, so it was probably around then that she obtained this ridiculous book. And I remember, um, just reading through it and, and finding all this really, really intense sex scenes. And it was like, <gasps> um, now I, one point, I think a couple of times I've pointed out that my mother didn't care what we read. She just wanted us to read. But my mother did not like me reading smut. And I'm sure my age probably had something to do with it. Although, I mean, by that point, I'd been reading Stephen King and Jackie Collins and whoever, whatever, for a few years at that point anyway. So, it, I mean, I was already reading adult books, so it didn't really matter that much. But this was a really adult book. <laughs> so I remember... Uh, going and getting it out of her closet a few times when she wasn't home over the space of a month. And then she eventually figured it out and she never confronted me about it or talked to me about it, but she just hid the book. So I couldn't find it. Um, and I remember finding it a long time later in a, like a hat box that she'd stuck at the top of the closet. So yes, my mother was repressed when it came to uh, really dirty stuff, which is kind of hilarious. <laughs> uh, but I guess, I mean, I guess most parents probably wouldn't want their kid reading something like that at my age at the time. Um, so, and I actually read the story, which I never did as a kid. So there's a lot of stuff in it that obviously I didn't remember. It's not a bad read. So I just want to show you, this is the original. Um, that's the original cover, Cherry Delight with her gun and her bikini. So the story is that she is a, uh, she's an operative for a secret spy, <laughs> spy organization called NYMPHO, the New York Mafia Prosecution and Harassment Organization. And she, uh, she solves problems by having sex with people. <laughs> lots and lots of sex with people. And I had actually bought The Italian Connection, which was the first um, the first book in the series, but I didn't get a chance to uh, finish it. I think I got about maybe 30 or 40 pages into it, and I just ran out of time. So in this one, uh, some three mafia hit men kill a guy, and then they take off for China. And Nympho finds out that this guy's been killed, and he was actually an op um, one of their operatives doing a an undercover thing and so cherry's delights assignment is to follow these guys to china to red china and to try and infiltrate and go and kill these guys and <laughs> so yes there's a series of sexual adventures including one where she's where she and her uh, the guy that she meets in in china are somehow managing to walk around the room and hump at the same time as she's spying on the guy in the next room. So figure that one out. I don't know. <laughs> Very few people are athletic enough to pull that something like that off. <laughs> oh yes. And the sex scenes are pretty ridiculous. And as, and yes, I, at one point she does dress up, not just yellow face, but full body makeup to make herself look Chinese. <sighs> ah, 
the depictions of the Asian characters, um, f for the time in which they're written, they aren't actually that bad, but they do speak in that awful, broken, swapping out L's for R's, terrible Asian speak that, uh, plays on stereotypes and is, I'm sure, quite offensive. Uh, it's, it's a little uncomfortable to read. Um, there's a lot of really good descriptions, and that's one thing I did notice about this book. Not so much uh, lay, the Late in the Future one, because that was trying to do some world building, but this one, there was a book that came out uh, a long time ago called Write Like the Masters by William Kane, and what he does is he goes chapter by chapter and he talks about, you know, what each author, each author, sorry, each chapter is devoted to an author and each author is unique in some way. And he looks at what makes that author unique. And one of the authors was Ian Fleming. And he said one of the things that really, really pays attention to details, clothes, drinks, food, guns, you know, um, just creating this very detailed world of, uh, of stuff and, you know, a lavish lifestyle. And, um, and I think that these books pay a little bit of a nod to that, that kind of writing where there's just, you know, there's descriptions of these lovely places that they go to and the delicious food that they eat and, you know, the clothes that they wear and stuff. Um, although, I mean, they don't spend too much time dwelling on it because the book itself is only like 135 pages and they got to get through the story as well. But I thought that was interesting. So Cherry goes and then there's a subplot in between killing the mob guys where her host tells her there's this treasure that he wants to go and find that belongs to the Tongs. Um, another thing that was interesting, that is interesting about Gardner Francis Fox, I read that like he was a very intelligent man and he was a very curious man and he kept a filing cabinet full of newspaper clippings and you know interesting facts from around the world and stories um and he drew from his research so that he could create these these places that he wanted to write about um and so he always pay to mind to giving interesting tidbits. And apparently he did this in his comic books too. He, he wanted people to learn something. And what I learned, because <laughs> I did look it up, there actually was a Tong Wars. Um, the Tongs were Chinese immigrants in the late 1800s in the US. And the, the word Tong itself means something like um, place or like, like a gathering, like a club. Um, and then the Tongs took their names from that. And in the late, from going, going from about 1897 to about 1921, there was a war for turf and resources and so on. And I'm not sure if it starts with somebody cleaving somebody's head the way he talks about it in the book, but it was a real period in history, um, which I think is, bears further reading. So, um, but this book, uh, had lots of sex, obviously, an exotic location, some very uncomfortable racial depictions, um, and a pretty violent last chapter. I was uh, surprised. I didn't realize it was quite that violent, Whew. <laughs> including Cherry Delight getting gang roped in the in after her sex organs being absolutely brutalized, which was pretty horrific. And here's where the other book that I read this week, what, I mean, it was really uncomfortable and exploitive anyway. It was another Gardner Francis Fox book. This guy's a treasure trove of absolute trash, by the way. <laughs> he should be a Garbingo card for next year. Um, yeah, Garbingo card on, all on his own because he's published, he published something like 150 novels under various pseudonyms. And he also, uh, he's something like 1,500 comic books. So he was a very, very prolific writer. 
So the other book that I read was called The Stonehenge Slaves. Oh boy. This one was deeply exploitive. I'm going to show you the, um, I'm going to show you the, uh, covers. Now, the original cover was this one. <laughs> I mean, it just looks like trash. And then this is the cover on the re-release, which apparently is a revised edition. So what I got, it wasn't apparently the original text. I'm, I'm not sure what's been added to it or what's been changed. So the story starts out with a young enslaved woman by the name of Delilah. She's 16. She's due to lose her virginity to the young, to the enslaved man who is the buck on the plantation. And apparently plantation porn was a thing in the 60s, which just, I mean, the premise itself is really uncomfortable, but to write an exploitation novel about it just adds to the discomfort. Um, and it doesn't matter what enslaved people are doing I mean, if how do I explain this? I mean, it it's good. no matter what, no matter how it's described, no no matter how the person feels about it, whatever. If if the master can beat the skin off your back, sell off the person's back, sell them, sell their children. With complete impunity it's there's there's no consent ever like, it just can't happen <laughs> so anyway so she's being forced to lose her virginity to the stud her name uh the stud's name is big cass or casanova and she doesn't want to so she goes and visits the um voodoo practitioner again very offensive stereotypes and uh, mama loa gives her this amulet and she takes it off thinking it's not doing any good for her. But at the last minute, before she has to put on a show for uh, the mistress's horrible friends, the owner, uh, well, the son of the owner of the plantation comes home. Okay, so I suppose I should explain that the plantation is owned by Randolph and Melissa Stone, who inherited it from their parents. And while Randolph's been away doing whatever... <laughs> you know, young aristocrats did in the early 1800s. <clears throat> Melissa's been running the place and she is a very, she's an awful person. <laughs> um, and she has been lenient with the slaves so that they, you know, have a little dignity. <laughs> and this is the slave, this is where the, the, the apologists come in, I'm sure. Oh, but, but, there were some nice plantation owners who let them learn to trade, but no, they were enslaved people. It doesn't matter if they were nice to them or not. They fucking owned them. Like, uh. anyway, so Randolph doesn't like the insubordination. So he, you know, breaks up the party because that, that's one another thing that Melissa has been doing is she's been having these parties where she has big Casanova gripe one of the women while all of her friends look on. Like I said, nasty people. And in the book's favor, one point in the book's favor is that every single white character is absolutely despicable. There is no redeeming quality here whatsoever. Like, they're just awful. So he takes in Delilah as his body servant, which means she bathes him and he grates her. Um, and she... <sighs> She feels good about it, but it's still not consensual because he can beat the skin off her back and sell her and her babies. So just no. <laughs> and Melissa is angry at losing the power that she had. So she takes in, so she starts teasing and manipulating one of the enslaved men, this young guy named Ned, who has a girlfriend who's another one of the enslaved women. Her name's Virgie and she's, she's a, a house worker and and
and she, uh, Melissa starts this weird thing with Ned, and it goes on and on. It's pretty horrific. <laughs> well, it's not horrific. I mean, it's erotica. Like, if these were consenting adults, it would be okay, but it's just creepy and weird. So as the story progresses, um, Randolph get is, he takes out, like, he's just a cruel, nasty man. And he calls it disciplining, you know, his property or whatever it is he calls it. And here's where it gets really gross. And this is a horror channel. And last year, or maybe two years ago, I read a book about black horror. And one of the things we see a lot of in the early days of horror is the exotic and the way that black bodies are treated as freakish and somehow exotic. But monstrous at the same time. Um, the uh, a lot of horror really deep really reaches into what colonization was based on that these people are somehow less than their white colonizing oppressors um and i'm i'm not the person to articulate this well because i'm i mean i'm white i'm you know asexual i'm just somebody who reads books and talks about them on youtube so i fully you know embrace that i'm not the person to properly critique this but if even i notice the depths of how the the black characters bodies are treated it's not enough just to have stereotypical depictions of the way the characters talk and and a sort of voyeuristic look at the sex lives of these different characters in with three of the black enslaved characters each one of them commits some perceived sexual indiscretion and is horrifically and, and their sex organs and secondary sex organs or their erectile tissues in general are horrifically tortured and punished for it and we saw this i saw this as well with the cherry delight because they had to torture her vagina first before they then raped her um and this idea of sexuality needing to be punished as a thread through these trashy exploitive novels makes them very uncomfortable <laughs> um so i wanted to have some sort of cogent <laughs> you know, thoughtful discussion about gender and race and power and how patriarchy oppresses men as well as women. But, you know, this is me. So now I'm going to talk about dicks. Ah, yes. The phallus. The schlong. <laughs> the wang. The penis, which... Way back in the day when I used to do a college radio show, my friend Martin always said that the, that, that the word penis sounded like a cartoon character. So we'd do this little silly voice. Ha ha ha, kids! Anyway, it was a whole thing. So I wanted to read... Or I, I wanted to read something about this depiction of the black characters as these hypersexualized desirable people but then when they're forced or even encouraged or even consensually do the things that the white characters expect them to do then they're horrifically punished for it i mean what the hell <laughs> 
Let me put you on hold for one second. All right, so the other book that I looked at this week as sort of an antidote to the trash is Hung by Scott Polson Bryant is the author's name. And Bryant was a, he is, I should say, a writer for a number of different publications. And Hung is, it's a meditation on dick size. And the myth of the black male organ. Now, obviously, there isn't a giant sample. It's not an academic paper. It's a series of thoughtful articles about different conversations, <clears throat> excuse me, that Scott, as a black man, has had, you know, since he was a, young, a very young man. And he starts out with a sexual encounter with a white woman, where she, she looks at him, she's like, oh, I thought you'd be bigger. And he paints a portrait of black male masculinity as expected to be these, you know, incredibly virile, you know, almost animalistic in their sexual prowess, you know, the giant dick. And he comes through example after example after example of how Black men are painted with this tremendous sexual power, and this is what gives them power, but this is also what is threatening to white men. And then we have the punishment by white men, like cops, um, which is the other meaning of the word hung, the lynching of the black male, because of the fear of black men's sexual prowess and it's books like um like the stonehenge slaves where you have exploitation you have black characters um written as these like incredibly irresistibly sexual creatures but they're forced into it by their white slave owners who then punish them for it and Hang on, I'm going to find the passage I want to read. All right, so I found the topic. It is the medical metaphorical power of a penis's size that gives it the psychological weight. Men lug into relationships with women and with each other. Essentially, it is a signifier. Remember, I told you about signifiers and signifieds. Of power, of prominence, of strength. So many men like to think that our primary attention to dick size is not about impressing women or not, about filling up that space women have or not, about succeeding as a man in, a, in the reflective mirror of a woman's or partner's eyes. But it isn't. It's a measuring stick of self-worth, of capabilities, of fallibilities, of winning and losing. Listen to the language we use. When is a guy described as the swinging dick? When he's the one with the most power? When is someone busting balls? When he's deliberately attempting to cut another man down to size, even playfully. When is someone being hit below the belt when that person is taking the roughest possible blow he has coming? Size, it's a male concern. Who has it? Who doesn't have it? Who wants it and who needs it? Who looks and who doesn't want to look? Or bring it all home. Who's a man and who's not? Or at least who's not as much of a man? It's the men's magazines that run articles about dick size. How to change it. What to do about it if it matters. Because for so many men, it's the very definition of who they are. And not only who they are, but why and where they are. Anatomy, according to Sigmund Freud, that great thinker about penises in life, is destiny. Or as some post-millennial Madison Avenue thinker put it, life's a cinch with an extra inch, which is the tagline for an exuberant advertisement for Dockers khakis, highlighting the brand's individual fit waistband that expands an extra inch. Okay, guys, it's because you're fat, not because... <laughs> and I'm fat, I'm not saying. Like, I, I like that extra inch around the waistband. Uh, anyway, you tell me what they're really selling to the hearts and minds and egos of American men hanging loose in their brand new pants. And for a lot of men, how you hang has a lot of lot to do with whom you hang with, where you hang, sometimes how long you hang once you get there. All of this tends to get played out in the work landscape, where the matrix of personal in, in ambition and intersects with an almost narcissistic phallic preoccupation with winning the game. 
Consider the term overcompensation, and I'm not talking the extra overtime coins in the check you bring home from the job. Got a Porsche? Maybe you're showing off that you're a player making moves, but you're probably overcompensating for a small dick. Muscle-bound body in the insurance office cubicle with no bodybuilding contest on the horizon? Maybe you're a gym rat of the highest proportions, disciplined and devoting to crafting the best packs on the beach, but you're probably overcompensating for a little dick. Your paycheck, your girlfriend's bus size, the predicted over-under on the game bet, your dick size, it's all all potentially measurable. Men measure. Bigger is better, whether it's that Hummer you drool over, that raise at the end of the fiscal year, that dangling piece of flesh between your legs. As one Armani-clad media executive said to me at a dinner party in Midtown, Midtown Manhattan recently, if you're a man, you want to prove yourself into the world that you measure up, that you're in the game. And it takes a certain equipment to win the game you're trying to play. Like the game of life, I asked him, that's the only game worth playing, as long as you're playing with the big boys. This, by the way, from a black Harvard MBA who, it said, has a huge dick. Now, as a woman, as somebody who never really cared all that much about the dick, guys, since the rise of feminism, there's been a vocal minority of men that I call WWMs, which is the kind of the opposite of the SJW, social justice warriors, the whinging white men. And they complain that <laughs> men are portrayed as idiots in media and that feminism treats women as idiots. Or sorry, feminism treats men as Id idiots. Feminist women treat men as idiots. This would be why. <laughs> what the hell, guys? What the hell? <laughs> My sister told me a joke a long time ago. And there's this uh, little girl and she's looking at her dad's big sword, you know. And that's hanging above the uh, above the fireplace and she says, "Mommy, what's that?" And she says, "Well, that's a sword." And she says, "Well, what's it for?" She says, "Well, it represents power and you know, a man's stuff and and how how powerful he is and and what prowess he has and the little girl goes do they believe that and mommy says yes that's why they're expendable guys i don't know why it matters <laughs> i mean the amount of time you spend dick measuring you could be spend reading books working on a dissertation getting a better job, doing something with yourself other than that. But after that introduction, as he starts going through the depiction of um, black men's physical prowess as what gets them ahead, it starts to make more sense. And it gets really interesting where he says there's this created myth that all black men are sort of expected to live up to and yet they're put in this state this this place of fear and violence from the authoritative state and so if so they can be black but not too black because if they are then they're going to be crushed down and it's i mean it's it's an interesting look at how deeply insecure that would make anybody, <laughs> um, regardless of whether he can measure up, so to speak, or not. And then the big swinging dick as a metaphor for men's power or lack thereof. Um, and then how white men are somehow expected to compete and then not measure up and... Uh, it's a really, <laughs> it's told in a slightly hyperbolic way, but the more he goes through, you know, sports and books and movies like Mandingo, which the books like the Stonehenge Slave, Stonehenge Slave was, I think it was written to try and cash in on Mandingo, which was already kind of an exploitive book. Um, which, by the way, I did pick up, but I just didn't have time to read it. It's over 400 pages. And after reading The Stonehenge Slaves, I just, I couldn't, I, I couldn't handle any of the more awful exploitive trash anymore. So 
I don't, I don't have any thoughtful conclusions about the books that I read. Just that the tone of Hung leaves me with this underlying feeling of fear and sadness um, for anybody who's ever felt inadequate. Because I assure you guys, you know what? It doesn't actually matter. We live in a great possible timeline. So even if you have a micro one, you can fix that with silicone. There are, there are contraptions you can, you can get. They're made of silicone. Everybody has a good time. And you can throw it in the dishwasher when you're done. So don't worry about it. All right. I, I don't know what else I'm going to say about dicks. I thought it was going to be funny, but the more I think about it, just the more uncomfortable it makes me. So I, <laughs> so it's, it's Garbagus. Next week is, uh, novelizations and possibly celebrity books, something written by a celebrity. So I'll come back with some more goodies. Hope you're reading lots of horror. Have a great day.